protection warning system. Now this is one fitted to a steam locomotive that's currently been restored on our railway and some railways have this gear mostly for the mainline engines and mainline connections but I'm just going to cover this in this video just so you can get an appreciation of what this modern bit of equipment is about and how it came to be. And this is your main module as you can appreciate on this here you have your 110 volt which came in on lines one and two that's your positive and negative AC 110 volts so that's driving the power for the module so this is your power module the red can as we call it and then when we actually activate the TPWS loops we will get the loop active light and that's when we actually drive the input then on our three and four lines this gold stripe here uh, sorry white stripe here means there's gold contacts fitted inside the early ones didn't have gold contacts there was lots of problems um, with various high resistances in them so gold contacts got fitted into these and then on your cans you have your output cans so you will have in this case a yellow and a green if you had a, an overspeed or a blue and a brown if you were having the uh, wrong direction moves so with every module goes a power module so same on this one we have another power module we have its matching can that goes with it gold contacts fitted on these that actually says it on the tops if you look very carefully uh, so this is a normal direction and this is the over speed side of it the um, just for the, the permanent speed restriction this one's used for on the rear of the modules on the base plate you will see there are some terminals and we start off with our input AC fuse our 110 volt AC fuse there that's on the positive leg one and all our terminals are labelled across, matching the diagrams. What you'll notice here is we have our output line, lines on the far right hand side, which is shielded. That's what these extra wires here are for. So we have our wires going out. These will go to our links and then our loops out on the ground. Um, the, you'll notice there's a plastic shield over the top of the terminals. You can only put your wires in the bottom and tighten them. You cannot get at the top wires. The top wires are set at the workshop and you are not allowed to go into them. So all we're allowed to do is go into the bottom wires there. So we have two loops out of here, our first loop and our second loop. You see them out on the ground. On the diagrams you'll see you have the 110 volt posi and negi links in coming at the top, that's 110 volts AC. Then you have the main inputs to drive the module on three and four followed by the suppression link on five and six which is strapped around then you also have the OSS proving so that's the overspeed proving in and out links on seven and eight if if you have an overspeed module this one doesn't have an overspeed module on it because it's just used as a permanent speed restriction so as you can see you have your four lines coming in there from the left hand side that's from your 110 volt power and you have your main power in on the top two lines and then the next two lines down that just drives your main input to drive the module itself to the video there's a few little basics i really need to explain as regards tpws the system itself is designed to not stop a signal being passed at danger but to mitigate the circumstances off a signal passed at danger by bringing the train to a controlled stop within a defined limit. Now the system originally was designed to work up to 75 miles per hour. However, there is a TPWS plus which adds an extra pair of loops further back. But the basic system itself, if this is our signal at red, you will have a pair of loops at the signal at a defined distance within the centre line either way. And you'll see this in the video in a bit. One of these will be an arm the other will be a trigger. The direction of traffic on this particular track is from right to left. So if we were to have the signal at red, these loops would be energised and being energised would bring the train to a stand if it tried to pass these. Now, obviously you can have a train coming down to a signal at stop that could be going too fast to actually stop at that signal. Imagine there's icy conditions on the rail, etc. So further out, we will have a pair of overspeed loops and these will be a set distance apart as a train proceeds at a correct speed or less than the correct speed over these loops a timing system will be initiated within the electronics of the actual system 
And as long as the train is going at the correct speed or less, it will not arm and bring the brakes on. However, if the train is going too fast, it will start to bring the brakes on. Again, this system is only armed at the time that the signal is at red. Now, there are some subtle differences. For instance, you can have permanent speed restrictions. Let's just say, for instance, there's a tunnel here, and this tunnel is 45 miles per hour. We may wish to put the permanent speed restriction pair of OSS loops over speed loops on approach to that tunnel. These will be permanently armed. And there's a subtle difference here. The TPWS train stop loops and over speed loops associated with the signal can be armed into the system so the signal knows if they failed. Whereas the over speed loops that are used as part of a speed restriction aren't normally indicated back to the signal box. These could be remote in the middle of nowhere. The example I'm using here is Duval's tunnel. So the maintainer, as he comes around and does his maintenance or her maintenance, will notice on the units themselves they have a little telltale light to tell you whether they're working or failed or not. And they can investigate what's going on there. So that's an example using OSS as a speed reduction. That's an example using the OSS and the TSS, the overspeed and the train stop system for in connection with the signal. There are also mini loops where you have adjacent platforms and lines within them platforms. If you were to use conventional style loops, the signal could accidentally spread onto an adjacent road and trip off trains in the opposite uh, platforms. So those are mini loops. They're roughly half the size of these normal loops. And again, also, you can use the OSSs in relationship to buffer stops. And again, up in Scotland, these have been also been wired in with directional controls on single line circuits, etc. There are various variations to these. So the TPWS system itself, up to 75 miles per hour. TPWS plus, 100 miles per hour. But again, theoretical, no limit to it. It depends how many of these you want to set, etc., etc., etc. The system in use in the UK follows these principles. There is one other notable exception. As regards normal TPWS with a colour light signal, should the TPWS fail, you can hold the colour light signal at danger using the proving circuit that you'll see in the video. However, with a semaphore signal, the only way that signal will go back to danger, unless it's motorised, is if you put the signal back to danger. So what we tend to do in the outlying sections where semaphores are used is we break the TPWS circuit actually through the controls for the signal or the lamp circuits to hold the signal behind the danger. And that's a good giveaway sometimes if you're a maintainer. You can actually see, well, I've lost, I've got a filament failure indication. I've also lost my TPWS. So there's something going on with that. And that's just differences in how it's wired around the country because not everywhere has colour light signals. The frequencies that these modules transmit out to the loops is quite important as well and this tells the train the information and the direction in which it should either notice or ignore uh, loops for instance if you've got bi-directional working. So for instance if you were to look at this, this is the OSS for a signal, so it's power module and it's transmitter and this is the train stop for a signal, so it's power module and it's transmitter. And in the direction of traffic, normally you would hit the OSS first and then hit the TSS at the signal. So frequency-wise, we would have a frequency of 64 kilohertz, then 65 kilohertz, 66 kilohertz. Now these are 0.25 kilohertz each, and that's important. So it's 64.25, 65.25, 66.25. Again, both these modules, the red modules, are the same frequencies. So Output wise, what you would get is 64.25, 65.25, 66.25, dropping back to 65.25 again. Same as these. So 64, 65, 66, if you imagine the loops. So if you were to look at these as loops out on the track, that's how you would get it. You'd get 64.25, 65.25, 66.25, drop back to 65.25. If they were bi directional, the frequencies would be down to 0.75 so again it tells the system that these are opposite direction frequencies so you have normal direction and opposite direction frequencies so just to recap on that 
as I mentioned, and this is a normal direction, normal direction, trains going in this direction. These are the overspeed loops and the train stop loops. We have the frequencies, which are, you can find this on Wikipedia on the internet, it's well known. There's quite a lot of sources out there, so this is nothing new. 64.2525, showing to the train borne system that it's a normal direction. So it should be looking for a 65.25. The stop loops are always the 65.25s. The next one then is 66.25. You can see they're going up. And the final one being another stop loop, same as this one, 65.25 kilohertz. So it follows a, a progression. The stop loops always being the same. And again, in the opposite direction, these will be 0.75. So again, the system can read these and know which one it's looking out for. 0.75, 64.75. So it, and again, it knows which ones to look out for. This is the TPWS train stop loop, which is actually located at the signal itself. And there is a set distance it should be set either plus or minus the center line of the signal and that's defined on the documentation when it's designed we have the two loops we have the arming loop and then the trigger loop and again you notice these are set immediately next to each other so that there is zero time limit between the operation of the two loops traditionally as you can see up here on the overspeed loops in the distance there is a set distance between the arming and the trigger on that if the train beats that time limit, it says that the train is effectively going faster than its allowed or permitted speed, and then it applies the brakes to bring the train to a stand at the signal, or within the braking distance of the signal. However, if the train passes this loop, the train stop loop, with the signal at red, because there's no distance between the two, it will instantly initiate a brake application and put the brakes on the train. The loops themselves, all they are, GRP plastic loop held down with various types of fittings to the rails. This is a Pandrola type attachment. GRP plastic, so it's completely insulated. We have a connector with housing that should have cable ties through. And there are different fittings to hold this down some to screwed sleepers, some to concrete, some to Pandrols such as this, some to fastway clips. The incoming cable is terminated into this termination box, which we don't have any access to, and then two wires act as a transmission loop around the exterior of the loop itself. As you remember from your electrical theory, if you apply a voltage, an AC voltage into a wire, it will throw off a magnetic field and that magnetic field is what the train senses and picks up and therefore acts upon the system on the train to put the brakes on. This is the overspeed which is up on approach to the train stop located at the signal down there. The overspeed loops, the arming loop and the trigger loop are set at a set distance apart for the speed of the line and the traffic required. So that as a train hits the overspeed uh, arming loop, it then starts to count internally in its electronic system to meet the trigger loop. Now, if the train's going faster than the permitted speed approaching the signal at stop, then it will activate the brakes. However, if the train is going slower than the permitted speed or at the permitted speed, the timing will not be beaten. So at that point, the brake application is not initiated. These are the adapters for mounting to wooden sleepers. They're simply three spike screws on each of the legs. On the train itself, there is an acknowledgement button, but also there is a cancellation button used should you need to pass a signal at danger, say for a signal fault itself. And what usually happens there for a short, brief period of time, or it will ignore the loops at the train stop itself, whichever is the lesser. But that needs to be cancelled off using the cancellation button by the driver itself after having the authority of the signaller. 